Welcome to Tattooed Freaks and Business Suits, recorded live in the kitchen of the Personal Touch Career Services in Denver, Colorado. I am your host, Donna Shannon. As a professional career coach, I help people navigate the hiring maze to get the jobs they really love. In addition to working with job seekers one-on-one, I do have a book available. You can find How to Get a Job Without Going Crazy on Amazon. And my special guest today is Charles McPherson, who is the founder and owner of the Charles McPherson Academy all the way up in Toronto, Canada. And he's also a published author who has done quite a bit of fun broadcasting things as well. Hi, Charles. Hello. All right. So um, our show's purpose is to explore and redefine the world of work, especially as Gen X, millennials, and those to come after seek positions of leadership that still allow them to be themselves. So every show, we explore a topic related to business or job searching. And of course, we're going to talk about tattoos. (laughs) Perfect. So our sponsor is the Personal Touch Career Services. We are Denver's top rated career coaches and resume writers. So we practice on all of those practical tools for your job search, including resumes, LinkedIn, job search coaching, and ongoing classes. So check out our ridiculously long website, which is personaltouchcareerservices.com. Once again, that's personaltouchcareerservices.com. Or, you know, you can just Google it. Hi, Charles. Hello. So um, let's just kick things off. Most of our uh, listeners are probably not all that familiar with you because you work with one of our specialty niche industries, that being private service. So Mm -hmm. why don't you tell me a little bit more about you, what this private service thing is, and uh, why did you go to found uh, your institute, your academy? So, I think just very briefly, you know, um, I went to hotel school, you know, when I graduated from high school, I went to to the hotel school. Um, I did that. I graduated. I went to the hotel business. I hated it. So, I quit after six months, much to my mother's disappointment who just finished paying for my education. Uh And then I ended up in the catering business. And I did that for five years. And then a very famous Canadian family that every Canadian knows and loves. The lady at the house, she said to me, I'd like you to come and be my butler. I said, be your butler. And I was like, what would I do? You know, all I could think about is I'll be like serving tea or something and answering Mm -hmm. the phone. Mm -hmm. And so she says, don't worry, I'm going to teach you. I think you'd be really good at it. And so I kind of took a leap of faith and I said, okay. And so every week, you know, she gave me lessons on how to be a butler. So not only on how to serve tea, but how you set a table or how you serve at the table, how you get the ketchup stains out of her kids' t-shirts, how you drive the car so the person in the back seat doesn't get nauseous and so on and so forth. And so it was a really great opportunity. And, and I worked for the family for seven years and um, I really kind of fell in love with it. And I realized, you know, I don't necessarily really believe in reincarnation, but I don't not believe in it. Mm-hmm. But I kind of felt that maybe I was a butler in a previous life because everything she taught me and everything that I did in this job seemed natural to me. And so mm-hmm. in a nutshell, as a butler, my job was to make their lives, the family's lives easier. And so, you know, sometimes people say when they hear that I'm a a butler, they go, oh, so you're a servant. But, you know, I'm not. I work in the domestic industry, but I'm not a servant. And that's, you know, a term really from, you know, the Victorian, you know, era in the 1800s. And it doesn't really apply today. Mm -hmm. And so private service or being a domestic is actually a very honorable career and one that I'm really proud to be in. And, And, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, you're running these, these homes. These people have either one or multiple homes, large homes, and mm-hmm. they have staff. And so as the butler, you're kind of like the CEO of a small business where you're, you know, kind of the master of, of all these things. And so, you know, or if you want to look at it from a different perspective, is you're running a small boutique hotel. So that's kind mm-hmm. of how I look at it. And so what I realized after, you know, kind of being in, in that, this business for a little while is that there was really a lack of skills of people learning on how to be in the domestic industry. And yet there's a huge demand for good people. And Mm -hmm. so we have a shortage. And so in 2008, I decided to open my school. And, you know, I'm really proud that, you know, we're now the only school in North America that teaches, you know, household management and buffering. Right. Right. And just to give like our listeners a sense of scale, when we say a large home, 
this probably doesn't apply to what you might think of. Oh, my parents had a large <laughs> home because it was 3,000 square feet. We're talking about properties that the main residence well, <laughs> is 30,000 square feet. Exactly. So, you know, acres. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, the largest house that, that I've actually worked in is, you know, 100,000 square feet. And it's got a family of two people, a mom and dad and three kids. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's a big house. Yeah. So, you know, so I like your analogy, you know, most people grew up in a house, you know, that's 1,200, 2,500 square feet. And that's what you do. And there's a family of three or four people that live in that. But, you know, the houses that I work in are really large. And so, I mean, I work in apartments in, in, in New York that are like 10,000 square feet. And that's just an apartment. Yeah. So that's ultimately what I mean when you're kind of running the small business is that you're running a housekeeping department because someone needs to keep the place clean. You're running a groundskeeping department of who is shoveling the snow or who's cutting the grass or who's cleaning the pool. You know, if it's an actual house, you're running kind of like food and beverage. So who is going to be like making the food and who's serving the food. And, you know, then there's maybe a personal assistant, you know, to help with all the correspondence and all that kind of stuff and buying gifts when you need and so on. So there really ultimately are a lot of, you know, different different people that are needed in order to keep a house of that size going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, for people who are outside of the industry, these are, are lucrative careers. They're six figure jobs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I think is interesting is that, and, and one of the things that I think is really fascinating is that, for example, you know, in, in Toronto, just as the example, a housekeeper that has no training can make maybe $40,000 a year. But if she drives and if she's actually been trained and actually knows her job well, a housekeeper alone could be making seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars a year, Mm -hmm. and that's just the housekeeping job. And so, for example, when you graduate from Butler School, the average person starts around fifty to sixty thousand dollars. But you know, very quickly within five years, you're at seventy-five to a hundred thousand dollars. And you know, Butler's after five years depending on, on how you, you know, hone your craft and the kinds of households you like to work in. You know, I'm in the process right now of placing a butler right now in Palm Beach where it's a woman actually, and she's going to make a quarter of a million dollars a year. Yeah. And that's a big number. You yeah, know, that's not, a, that's not something to, to close your eyes at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anyways. So that's just a little bit of this crazy nutshell of a very yeah, exactly. fascinating industry. Yeah, I've been around private service myself for... Um, my goodness, well over 10 years now. And it's one of the niche industries that we serve, but we do a lot in another business realm. So right. one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today, because I think this matters in, in any industry, is the whole concept of manners and etiquette. Yes, yeah. And so just a quick history about like, where do manners and etiquette come from? Can you tell me anything more about that? So etiquette and manners, you know, have always been around within society. But the way that we know of etiquette today really comes, you know, from the court of Louis XIV in France. And when he built Versailles in the 1700s, that was really the first time that, you know, he was very particular, Louis XIV. He was known as the Sun King and he liked order and he hated, you know, disorder. And so that was the first time when invi- you know, invitations would come and on the back of the invitation, it would you know, be told, you know, show up on time. You have to wear clean clothes. You know, you must be shaven, you know, kind of thing. And there was, you know, those rules were starting to be there because it, he was very particular about those kinds of things. And so from his court, it then spread throughout Europe and then, you know, kind of came into the rest of the world. So the manners we know today really ultimately come from the French, which mm-hmm. I think is interesting because most people think that manners come from the British, but it actually comes from the French. Mm, interesting. Interesting. But so are, would you say that manners are still relevant today and why would they be? So manners are 100% relevant today because, you know, manners are really about how we treat each other and it's the code of how we interact with each other. And so, you know, manners are not just for, you know, rich or snobby people, but manners are for everyone every day. So, you know, how do you have breakfast at the breakfast table, you know, with your family? How do you talk to the bus driver on the way to work? And how do you deal with your coworkers? You know, how do you deal with, you know, a potential future mother-in-law or father-in-law? And so, And so manners are really all about not trying to be snobby, 
But manners are really all about how you put other people at ease. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, when everybody knows what to do, everyone feels more comfortable. And so one of the examples I like to use is, you know, in etiquette is when you shake someone's hand correctly. So if I know how to shake a hand correctly and you know how to shake a hand correctly, when we go to shake hands, we know that we use our right hand, we extend it, that we go cup to cup between the thumb and the first finger. We know how much pressure we use, which is the amount of, you know, what it would use to hold a water bottle. And, you know, we shake an average of three to four times and we release our hand. Once we know how to do that properly, then we have self-confidence in ourselves because we know how to do the ritual, which mm -hmm. is, of course, the handshake. And so manners really are about rituals, ultimately. And ultimately, it's about putting people at ease when you know things. It's, it's, it's for everybody in everyday life. It's not just for a certain part of society. And so the reason I think it's still relevant today is because we still ultimately want to make people that we're meeting either on a job search or that we're meeting socially um, or, you know, our neighbors that, you know, that we want to be able to put people at ease. Mm -hmm. I think it comes back into the nonverbal communication too. I think we've all Absolutely. met somebody who was maybe shy or awkward and didn't make eye contact and, you know, you try to go shake their hand and they're just like, and they do the awkward wave thing. Yeah. Um, you know, for the, and so, the, the when person you have... trying to reach out, I'm all like, exactly. person dislike me. And then the person who's all awkward going, I don't even know like what to do because I don't meet people face to face very often. And it, it makes a bad foundation for the relationship, really. I love that. It, it is a bad foundation for the relationship. And, you know, ultimately, if someone's not comfortable, you can't build that relationship. And so that's what I love about manners is that when you know how people are going to act, that it helps put you at ease. And so you can build a relationship. You can start to go in a certain direction. And so ultimately, you know, manners really help us socialize with each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I said, whether it's how you're going to eat, you know, breakfast at the breakfast table, you know, not chewing with your mouth open and not, you know, holding your knife and fork and pointing that at your brother across the table because you're irritated with him at, the, at that moment in time or whatever. That's what manners are really about. It's just how to be comfortable with everyone. Yeah. I think, I don't know if this is the same up in Canada and in Toronto, but sometimes I notice this, especially around um, Denver is a very casual kind of city. And I think sometimes we see this happen in the workspace where uh, in this misguided effort to have a casual company culture, it starts going oh, to people treating each other like they do on Facebook. Right. Right. You know, and I think, you know, and I talk about that often when I talk to businesses that, you know, I think it's always a mistake to be too casual in a business. And so, you know, you want to have casual Friday or you want to have a casual office, but that doesn't mean that you can't still be professional. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going casually to the office doesn't mean going in cutoff shorts that are, you know, a little bit too high and a tank top because that's really not appropriate in an office space. And, you know, people say, yeah, but it's casual and so on and so forth. You know, that's what the office told us to do. But remember, you want people to take you seriously. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're going to be in the office and you're going to be too casual, then, you know, the next time we're looking for a promotion for, you know, the new sales manager for the office, you know, your name doesn't really come to the top of the list because they're thinking, well, you know, you know, that Donna, she's not always, you know, dressed very appropriately on, you know, mm -hmm. casual days. And so we don't want her to embarrass us in front of the client. And so you kind of lose it. And so you have to remember that you're always at work, even if it's casual and to stay professional. And those manners really help you succeed there. Right, right. So um, let's talk for a moment about protocol. So sometimes when yeah. I think about protocol, that's like um, if you're dealing with some international business persons, we know the protocol is going to be different. Uh, yes. But uh, like just to give an example, I know uh, Japanese business people are very formal in the way they present the business card to you. Yes. And you should accept it in a certain manner, right? So in, in Japan, and it's actually in, in, in most parts of Asia now, and it's actually going into our Western culture, when <clears throat> the Japanese present their business card, it's presented with two hands. The writing on the card has to face the person. So as I would present the card to you, you would then with both of your hands accept the card 
you would read the card and you have to make sure that you read the card and then you have to hold the card while you're in the conversation. You can't put it in your pocket. Or if you're at a board table, you have to put the card on the table in front of you during the meeting. You don't put it away because in Asia and particularly in Japan, the business card is perceived as giving part of your soul or part of yourself to someone. Mm -hmm. But in North America, you know, you and I look at the business card as just a printed piece of data and mm -hmm. that there is no other. The value is just I've got your name and your phone number on it or your email address. But we don't we don't put the same uh, uh, attachment to it. But, you know, that's a really good point when you talk about protocol, you talk about the business card, something so simple and how you could either offend someone uh, mm -hmm. by not doing it correctly or more importantly, which is what I think the role of etiquette and protocol is about, is how you could make someone feel welcome and it could actually help you with the business deal because you're aware of another culture. And that's what I think is important. Yeah. Yeah. So how about like protocol lines within your own company or your own industry? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that I always tell, you know, people in, in Butler School, so it's kind of like my, one of the things I talk about is, you know, if you always start out formally, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Jones, you know, let them in the office, you know, say, oh, please call me David, please call me Mary. But mm -hmm. if you always start professionally, you'll never offend anyone. Mm -hmm. But if you go to, you know, someone who is a manager or a boss, and you say, hi, George, you know, maybe George wants you to call him Mr. Smith. Yeah. And because of his role. And so you can, it's hard when you start informally to go up to be formal. But if you start formally, you'll never be criticized. And someone will always say, oh, that's very kind of you, but please just call me George. Right. And then you can go down and then you know how to address each other. And so, you know, I think when you're in the office, it's about knowing how to respect your peers and, and how to address them. And, you know, if you if you always think about that, I think it helps guide you to make the right decision. Yeah, yeah, and I oftentimes teach the same thing when going in for an interview. You know, yes, when you have that I very first interview, point. yeah, you need to show up in the suit because unless you've been instructed something different. And you know what? And I think that I agree with you 100%. And when I walk in that interview, even if when the interview was confirmed with you and at the bottom it just said, looking forward to seeing you Tuesday at, six, uh, at 3 p.m., you know, thank you, Mary, I would still walk in and I would be in my suit and, you know, I would shake her hand and I would say, Mrs. Smith, thank you for seeing me today. I'm really appreciative. Oh, no, no, please call me Mary. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you that, you know, manners are important in business. And, you know, lawyers, for example, which I think is really fascinating, you know, when they are looking for articling students, they often will take, you know, the final group out for lunch. And they're not taking you out for lunch because they're concerned that you're hungry. Mm. They're taking you out for lunch because they actually want to see your table manners because they want to know, are you going to embarrass them in front of a million dollar client? Mm -hmm. Because lawyers are often, you know, having meals with clients. And I think that's really fascinating when you think about that. And so you could go down. So Donna, you and I could be, you know, article students going for the exact same job. We both graduated from, you know, good universities, Ivy League universities, as the example in this case. We both have the same marks. We both have done the same kind of volunteer work. And they can't decide the difference between you or me. And it could be just coming down to, to that lunch where if I, you know, make a fool of myself at the table and, you know, start eating, you know, with my hands as opposed to using a knife and fork properly, and you were to use your knife and fork properly, that could give you the competitive advantage to get the job. Mm -hmm. or, or my greatest weakness is I drop food on myself all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so you know, knowing that is then, okay, so what am I going to order so that I make sure that I don't drop something on myself? Yeah, you know? don't, don't so go for with me, the that's long, soup. stringy spaghetti. <laughs> exactly. No spaghetti. And I never, ever, ever order soup in a restaurant because yeah. I, that's something I do. I always spill soup on myself when I'm in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've spilled your soup, then there's hope for me. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen, I've had many meals with you, Ms. Donna, and I think you have nothing to worry about. Oh, I don't know. I've gotten worse over time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some things that you might want to avoid, like things that are obviously rude. And well, I think uh, one of ahead. the big ones, and I think more people have gotten sloppy about this, 
is bringing your cell phone into the business meeting. And I hate so that's that we're really fascinating. Meeting and people have their cell phones sitting on the table face down. And then as you're talking, they pick it up and they start looking at it or doing something on it. So you're right. That's rude. And, and in North American European culture, we really kind of get offended by that. But what I think is interesting is that, for example, when you go to Asia, they consider that normal and everybody yeah. has um, has their cell phone and they do look at their cell phone. So it's also a cultural thing. But, you know, so, but the cell phone, I think, is you need to be aware of. I think that's a great, great point. You know, I think, you know, in business, you know, some of the faux pas, for example, is, you know, knowing, you know, how to address people. So we talked about that. So always start formally. Um, and I think that, you know, how you dress also reflects uh, your image. Mm -hmm. And people, whether we want to agree to it or not, people judge us, you know, directly or indirectly based on how we're dressed. Now, you know, that doesn't mean you have to go and spend a lot of money on clothes. You know, I, I love the concept of, you know, I kind of think of, you know, the uniform. And so I think of, you know, the student who's got their first job, you know, working uh, in a in an office, well, they don't necessarily have a lot of money to go and buy suits and shirts and ties or dresses or whatever. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And so I think, you know, get yourself, you know, a Navy suit, you know, five Navy, you know, shirts for the sake of the argument or blouses. And then, you know, get yourself, you know, a couple of different ties and just pull yourself together and you just keep, you know, your uniforms that you're not having to spend a lot of money, but you look classically put together all the time. And I think that's also a really important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes too, the, the dressing appropriately, um, here's a weird thing. The way the owner or the CEO dresses is not necessarily the dress code for the office. That's very interesting. I've never thought of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're right. I think you're right. I think yeah. that, that, again, you are being judged, fairly or not, about, about how you look. Yeah, and I've seen many business owners and CEOs that it's all like, you are expected to be this way, but I, you know, and I'm guilty of this sometimes myself too. And I did an interview with a gentleman and he had already met me before and he had seen me in other capacities. So when he came in for his interview, he was wearing a button shirt and jeans. And I still go back and forth on this candidate going, why in the world, knowing that I'm a career coach, would he think that it would be appropriate to wear jeans to an interview to work for me? And then I'm like, the, my brain goes, well, he's seen me in jeans. And then I go, no, that's not acceptable because I'm the owner and I'm eccentric. So I can get away with it. <laughs> well, how about this? I was in Florida, you know, with a client last week and I was interviewing estate managers and one of the estate managers came to me in a pair of khaki shorts and a polo, uh, a blue polo t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at him and thinking, you, you're going to, to the beach or something. Like, why are you dressed like that? Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and I was, you know, a little bit more formally dressed and, you know, everyone else who I had interviewed, men and women had all come in business suits. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a job that pays a lot of money and it's a serious job. And, you know, I just kind of made some little comics. I was trying to figure out why. And he says, well, you know, it's Florida. And so I thought, you know, I should come a little casually, you know. And, yeah. and, and I just remember he didn't get it. Yeah. Uh, and so he obviously didn't go to the next stage. Yeah. But, you know, I think also while we talk about it, let's talk about one more thing I think that's really important for your listeners. And that is, you know, when we go to an office, we traditionally know how to conduct ourselves, which is that, you know, we're supposed to be professional and, you know, how we dress, you know, for those of us that are paying attention and so on and so forth. But sometimes in private service, people get confused because you're going to someone's house sure. and you think, oh, do I change differently or do I act differently because I'm going to someone's house? And they kind of forget, no, that's still your place of work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I remember, you know, one day a house manager went for an interview and she brought a box of chocolates. And I said, what are you bringing chocolates for? It's an interview. She mm -hmm. said, well, I was going to someone's house. I was always taught when you go to someone's house, you bring something. Oh. <laughs> and and I thought, oh gosh! And then I thought, okay, well, but you didn't, didn't get it. Bring wine. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that would that be great for an interview. But yeah. you know, she didn't understand that, you know, she wasn't going to Sally and Bill's house, she was going to Mr. and Mrs. Jones's house for an interview and their house is your office. Mm-hmm. So I think that's important. And again, you know, not to make that kind of mistake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So here's an interesting trend in, in the U.S. And tell me if the Canada is doing the same thing. Is some of the FCC regulations have changed on you know, the seven deadly words you're not allowed to say on television, right? Yes. And, yes. You know, in particular, it's the colorful term for crap it shows up a lot. Yes. On, yep on regular TV now hasn't made it to like the main broadcast stations like ABC and NBC and those guys, but all the broadcast cable stations it has. And I, I am guilty of doing colorful languages in my own office, but at some point there's that understanding that what you see on TV is not necessarily correct for what you need to do in a professional environment. I think you are correct. And I think that, you know, again, you know, whether we want to admit it or not, people are judging us when they're with us and particularly for that inter- during that interview stage. But even once you have the job, you're always being judged and, and thought of and, you know, maybe about a promotion or a raise or, you know, to be able to, to get a new client with the firm. So, you know, I think, again, it, it comes back down to the way you speak, the way you dress, you know, the way you conduct yourself you know, people at the end of the day are judging you and it, it can help you and it can hurt you uh, as you try to move forwards. Yeah. And if it's because you're trying to tell jokes in the office, just here's one thing to keep in mind. I've done a little bit of comedy and I used to be in radio. It's way more challenging and funny sometimes to work clean than to just go for the lowest common denominator. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Anyways, so now we're coming to one of my favorite part of the sh- uh, show where we get to talk about the tattoos of the day. And Charles, you don't have any tattoos. I do not, but I love tattoos. And it's, you know, it's just something I've been chicken to get one only because I, I just think it's going to hurt. It's you know, this needle that keeps going in you. <laughs> so I'm petrified. Mm-hmm. Um, and people like you say, don't, it's going to be fine. But I am scared. And so that's why I've never done it. Mm-hmm. Um, is I'm a chicken when it comes to needles. Right. Um, but I think some tattoos are very beautiful. And I think that, you know, I happen to love, you know, beautiful tattoos. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were telling me about one that um, you particularly admired recently from a person from Venezuela. I- well, exactly. And so I saw someone recently and, you know, he was um, at the pool and he was from Venezuela and he had in a very pencil line, thin drawing, if you will, the outline of the country of Venezuela on the side of his body. Mm-hmm. And it was discreet, but yet it was there and it was really beautiful and really well done. And I remember asking him, I said, what does that represent? He said, oh, it represents Venezuela. And then I could see how it did but I just thought it was really beautiful. And it's something that in the last, I saw it, you know, four or five days ago, and I've been talking about it for four days, mm-hmm. you know, to everybody saying, oh, that's yeah. a great tattoo. So, yeah. Yeah. But, and of course, there is still etiquette around tattoos as well. Like, uh... there is. And so, you know, <laughs> it, it can hurt you also, you know. So, you know, I want to, you know, to tell your listeners that, you know, free speech, I think, is important. And being individual and who you are is very important. And I don't think, you know, I'm not suggesting that we have to all be these robots. I don't think that would be a very nice world to live in either. But you have to think about what kind of industry do you work in? And if it's a conservative industry, then you have to be conservative either in your dress and or your tattoos. And, you know, because again, they're going to be looking at that. And so, you know, I, you know, I do television, you know, quite often here, you know, uh, in Canada. And, you know, there was some person on the set, you know, one of the techies who got a tattoo right on his Adam's apple and his neck of a full bloom, you know, yellow, orange rose. And, Mm -hmm. Although at first it kind of looked really amazing, but then I thought to myself, how is this guy ever going to be able to do anything else? And I realized, you know, he's happy being in the tech industry, you know, working, you know, on movie sets and TV sets. So it actually, in his case, is going to be fine. But, mm-hmm. you know, even if he, you know, was to put a suit on to go to a wedding or to go to a funeral or something, it's going to show. So yeah. I don't have a problem with that if that's 
if that's a life that you want to lead and if if you're comfortable with that then i support you 100% yeah. but the problem is our world isn't always so you know open and so if he wants to go work you know in a conservative law office one day that's going to be a real problem for him yeah yeah my first husband actually uh, towards the end of our marriage, he got some tattoos down on his forearms, which are yes. naked women. So full on naked women. Yes. And, um, you know, he was in the trades for the longest time. He was a machinist and then he was, became an electrician and all this stuff didn't matter then until he decided he wanted to get a job in healthcare and work in hospitals. And then he would complain that he had to wear these hot clothes because they he had to wear full sleeves to yep. cover up all the naked women around the children in the hospital. It's like, well, yep. you know what, Eric? That was the choice you made. <laughs> and, but, you know, I think part of the problem is that, you know, you make the choice – but you don't necessarily know what life is going to be down the road because when he got them, it probably never occurred to him that, you know, he would one day have a job where that wouldn't be appropriate. Right. And so that's what's also hard is that, you know, you're trying to, you know, live your life and do something that you like, but, you know, you don't know how it's going to affect you. And, you know, I don't want to say to everybody who's listening, well, then you can only, you know, you have to be boring the rest of your life because that wouldn't be very much fun either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm finally to the point now where I'm starting to run out of canvas, meaning I have a lot of tattoos. So Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> Your and, real estate's all about taken, so there's no more tattoos it, coming. It's well, there's still more tattoos coming, but now they're starting to run into the more visible spots. So Okay. Anyways. Well, Charles, thank you very much for joining me on the show today. Tell me again the titles of your books, uh, any of the TV shows that you're on right now, and of course, a little bit more about the Charles McPherson Academy and how people can get a hold of you. So my book, you know, is by Penguin Random House. And um, so there's The Butler Speaks, which is uh, my first book and has been a national bestseller. And it's both in hardcover and in soft. And then there's uh, a series which I'm doing right now, which is called the Pocket Butler series. And so there's the Pocket Butler, which is a mini version of the Butler Speaks. Then there's the Pocket Butler's Guide to Travel, which came out this October, which is, you know, everything that I've learned about how to travel and how to make life easy when you're traveling. And then, you know, next spring we'll have another Pocket Butler coming out, which will be about housekeeping. So we've got great little books that are out there. And then, you know, on television, which you can see on the internet, the Marilyn Dennis Show, uh, which is in Toronto, I'm, you know, Charles the Butler. And so I'm usually on the show every Monday across Canada. And so I talk about, for example, what we're talking about today, etiquette things, or, mm -hmm. you know, people, you know, or don't know how to set a table for something or how to deal with the stain or whatever. So we always have fun conversations when it's Marilyn and I. And then um, lastly is the Butler School, which, you know, we're very proud of. And so, you know, you go to our website, which is charlesmcpherson.com. And there's, you know, the school link that's right there. And, you know, it's really, it's an incredible career. And it's, you know, our school is about being hands-on and teaching people, you know, how can you be really successful and transition into this career? So mm -hmm. hopefully your listeners will want to go check it out. Yeah, excellent. So thank you again, Charles. And uh, for those of you listening, please give us a like, follow us, uh, make some comments if you like what we're doing. And uh, don't be mean. So don't troll me. <laughs> uh, until next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.